Okay, thank you, Kylie. On behalf of Sangeeta Gopal, who's Associate Professor in uh, Cinema Studies, and uh, she, she will be the Interim Director of CSWS right now, she's Associate Director. And uh, Bish Sen, who's Associate Professor in Media Studies um, in the School of Journalism at the University of Oregon. Welcome um, to our third um, conversations about our world conversation. Um, the title of the talk today is Identity, Ambivalence, Homecoming, Travels Between Asian and Asian American Studies. Uh, the speakers today are Roy Chan, who is Associate Professor of Chinese in the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures, and Andrew Wei Leong, Assistant, Assistant Professor in the Department of English at UC Berkeley. I will introduce them a little bit more, um, but first I'll start with um, a territorial statement. The University of Oregon is located on the Kalapuya Ilihi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Rowan Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Silas Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities at the University of Oregon and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Next, I want to just thank um, our sponsors of this series. Um, there's many units that have contributed to um, this event and all of the events of the series. I want to thank a the Asian Studies Program, the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies, the Center for the Study of Women in Society, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of Anthropology, History of Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies, sociology. I'd also like to thank the Global Health Program, Glo the Global Studies Institute in the Division of Global Engagement, and the Oregon Humanities Center, Center's uh, Endowment for, the public, for Public Outreach in the Arts, Sciences, and Humanities. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to just uh, thank Kylie Post, Melody Moore, Jacob Box, Morgan Hayward, uh, Ward Biagni, Lori O'Halloran, and Dennis Galvan for uh, working to make this uh, series happen, uh, meaning for rehearsals, everything involved with it's staging a production because it's on Zoom. Uh, I know I've missed out on some people. Uh, I apologize for leaving them out, but um, thank you to all of them. I also want to um, just give you a heads up and an invitation to our next and final talk of the series. It's entitled Bioethics in the Time of Black Lives Matter, a Black Feminist Perspective. That will be on Thursday, May 27th, uh, between 4.30 p.m. and uh, starting at 4.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Uh, the speakers will be Kamisha Russell, who's Assistant Professor at the University of Oregon, the Department of Philosophy. Um, and Yolanda Wilson, who's associate professor at Albert Nady Center for Healthcare Ethics at St. Louis University. Please try to join, join us. It will be Thursday, May 27th, starting at 4.30 p.m. Pacific. So the format of this conversation will be a conversation between our two speakers. Um, and uh, they'll uh, speak for about um, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and then if you have any questions after the, the discussion is over, um, we invite you to post any questions in the comments, uh, or sorry, or you can post any questions or comments in the chat window um, of the platform. And now I get to finally introduce our speakers. Okay, let's start with uh, Andrew, our, our guest. Andrew Wei Leong is an assistant professor of English and, and Center for Japanese Studies core faculty at the University of California, Berkeley. 
His research focuses on the literature of Japanese diasporas in the Americas. He is the tra translator of Lament in the Night, published by Kaya Press in 2012. He's also uh, the translator of two novels, Nagahara Soshun, Shosun, sorry, an author who wrote for a Japanese reading public in Los Angeles during the 1920s. Uh, Andrew Leong is completing a manuscript tentatively entitled A Queer, Queer Race, Orienting Orientations for the Early Japanese American, for Early Japanese American Literature. Let me read that. Uh, the manuscript is tentatively entitled A Queer, Queer Race, Orientations for Early Japanese American Literature. This book examines Japanese and English language texts written by authors who resided in the, in the United States between the opening of mass Japanese emigration in 1885 and the closure marked by the Immigration Act of 1924. Leong's recent articles and book chapters have appeared in Japan's Russia, the New Whitman Studies, the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Literature, Comparative Literature Studies, and Verge Studies in Global Asia. Look forward to that book, uh, Andrew. Um, and now uh, the, uh, our host, Roy Chan. Roy Chan is Associate Professor of Modern Chinese Literature in the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures at the University of Oregon. He is also currently Program Faculty in the Department of Comparative Literature. His first book, the Edge of Knowing, Dreams, History, and Realism in Modern Chinese Literature was published by the University of Washington Press in 2017. He is currently finishing a book manuscript on Chinese literature's speculative relationship to Russia and the modern world. That I also want to definitely read. Please, Roy, let me know when it's out. So without further ado, uh, thank you again to our um, two speakers and please take it away. All right, thank you. So looking at the attendees on our roster, I am intimidated by the folks who are on our roster and I am feeling severe performance anxiety, but I hope we can make this a worthwhile time for all of you. I want to begin by thanking the uh, faculty organizers, professors Arafat Balyani, Sankita Gopal, and Bish, Sen, and Bish Sen for giving us this opportunity to share our thoughts. Uh, and also for modeling what diversity in intellectual and academic life uh, can look like in actuality beyond the non-performative declarations that we are so used to hearing day in and day out in our institutions. I also want to thank Kylie Post and the other organizers for just doing all the organization and making this so smooth. And finally, of course, I want to thank my uh, good old partner in crime, uh, Andrew Leong, for, for get, get, taking the time to share uh, his insights with us. So, what I wanted to begin with was to think about the title that I came up with uh, and I struggled with, and finally I, I just gave up and said, okay, identity, ambivalence, homecoming. And I'm not exactly sure why I picked those terms, but they were meaningful to me. Um, but what I want to start off with is, is, is not to suggest that there's some kind of dialectical resolution here, that we start with identity, then we question it with ambivalence, and then we resolve ourselves in homecoming, right? Uh, I, I want to keep the speculative tension between these three terms going, and that's why in the subtitle, I really focus on this idea of traveling traveling between Asian and, Amer and Asian American studies, traveling between self and other. Um, that doesn't uh, evacuate the meaning of home or the meaning of identity, um, but perhaps we can push towards a more speculative understanding uh, that uh, engages both uh, stasis uh, and, dynam and dynamism. And maybe I'll just start off by just um, taking it, to, uh, letting Andrew, like if you could reflect a little bit about um, these terms and what they mean to you. Um, yeah, let's take them in the order that you provided them. So I, I take your caution about not thinking about, say, homecoming as a dialectical resolution of an antithesis of identity and ambivalence. But I do, and thought about this last night, want to note that there is in some ways a pleasing formal one, two, three sequence that seems to be going on at least poetically or rhythmically with the idea of identity, which brings to mind's mind ideas of oneness, singularity, ambivalence, which at its root 
suggests bifurcation, duality, standard cliches about being in two worlds. Um, and then homecoming, you know, that might be harder to link to a, an idea of threeness or something like that, um, but at least has three syllables, so can be worked out that way in terms of its sequence. Um, I thought that maybe one place to start with uh, term number one, identity, is to ask you um, what your thoughts of and are about what identity means in pedagogical contexts and professional contexts. Um, and we can maybe start from there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question because I would say that for most of my education and graduate life and academic life, I ran away from the term identity. You know, I was a Russian major. Uh, that was in many ways an escape uh, from my Asian Americanist, my Chinese Americanist. Uh, I became a comparative literature scholar and I wanted to kind of teach the universe, teach the world. Um, and you know, we were talking about this yesterday that I think to a very small group of people, you know, I am recognized as a scholar of China and Russia. You know, I, I work on philosophy, I work on aesthetics. Um, but the reality is that outside of that, uh, to most of the university at large, uh, I am read as an Asian American professor. And so there's an interesting kind of ways in which identity feels something that's externally imposed rather than uh, willfully, volitionally kind of claimed. Uh, and there's a kind of interesting experience of diaremption between how I see myself or what I'm doing uh, and how the rest of the institution, the rest of the world sees me. And certainly in, in the background of color related Asian racism, we're seeing this kind of splitting happening all the time, a kind of, um, and you know, one of the things was, was to rather than constantly bemoan that and go, well, why won't people see me the way that I want to be seen? Why not envelop, embrace, sit with the direction, the splitting, right? And can it be a platform for doing good work, not just on behalf of myself, but on behalf of other students uh, and certainly uh, colleagues of color. Uh, and so I've definitely become a real spokesperson and advocate for faculty of color and promotion committees and, uh, and with the union. Um, and it's a way for me to kind of just deal with that kind of experience of splitting, right? Uh, and it's not an ideal situation. Uh, we are nowhere near the utopian ideal by any means, um, but rather than bemoaning a, a sense of split identity, what if we envelop it and try to make sense of it as part of our actuality? I don't know, what does it mean to you? So the example that's coming to mind here is, um, I was reading a, a short uh, piece written by the scholar Eddie Yasuhara, a Busan specialist who went on to uh, do a lot of um, administrative work in the California State University system as part of a festschrift at the retirement of a professor in Japan. And the title of this piece was uh, Becoming Japanese American. And Eri Yasuhara had um, done work for the Japanese American Research Project, um, which was an, a kind of outgrowth of sociological, anthropological surveys conducted on Japanese American um, populations in the post-war, but also included a gathering of a large amount of Japanese language uh, materials produced by um, Japanese Americans. Um, and she had, uh, because she was 1.5 generation, uh, had more Japanese ling linguistic proficiency than many of her um, second generation uh, uh, members of her age cohort, I suppose, and uh, was involved in that, in that project. But she didn't pursue um, the kind of work that I do, which is reading that that material as a professional career. And this was in the late 1970s and 1980s. And in, in that statement, it was really interesting to read her take on um, identity, that the idea that you could become a scholar that reads Japanese language, Japanese American literary texts was utterly unfathomable. And even in the emergent field of Asian American studies at that time, um, the, there were people pursuing doctorates in history, or the social sciences, but uh, not literature. And so that disconnect between what might be a personal identity and a professional identity and how that uh, overlaps with questions of, of language is, is something that um, has, has stayed with me as a, as a kind of running concept that 
one's you know personal racial identity, how one's identified on the uh, census, how one is hailed um, externally may have absolutely nothing to do and ought not to have anything to do with uh, one's research in some way. Uh, and on the other hand, um, you know it it really does bear on what is thinkable and unthinkable, um, the obstacles that one might encounter when entering uh, different professional fields. Yeah, that's a really great point that you make. You know, so this past fall, I taught a course of, um, that was about um, constructions of cultural difference in relation to China and Chinese Americans. And it was an honors course, uh, mostly freshmen, sophomores, I had about 20 students. Um, and it was an interesting course because it was, it was the most personal course I had ever taught. I was teaching Chinese American literature that I had never taught before. I was teaching American literature about Chinese I had never taught before. I taught Jack London's um, The Yellow Peril and The Unperiled Invasion, which were your suggestions, by the way. So thanks, Andrew. And it was the most personal course I ever taught because I had a sense that something was happening. Well, anyway, it was happening, let's, let's not let's be honest. Uh, and that students needed to know about it, that we needed to talk about what was going on with Asian America, with Chinese Americans and so on. Um, and on one hand, it was very personal because it was in some ways my experience, but it was also very alienating. It, it was a sense in which my personal life and subjected as an ob object of study and teaching what felt like a foreign country. Um, and it was a very weird experience for me, um, but, but I think it was a productive experience, right? The sense in which um, when your identity becomes externalized from you so that you can actually look at it, that you can actually uh, gaze upon it. Um, and I really try to emphasize that with my students. And in fact, one of my best students from the classes is attending this and she really latched on um, to some of these, some of these ideas. Um, that, you know, this idea that you know who you are because you happen to be is a false proposition, right? That being and knowing aren't exactly the same thing. And it's very often our cliched understanding of identity, we seem to kind of collapse those two or collapse the personal and the professional. So clearly there's a link, but there's also a meaningful um, critical uh, uh, distinction there, that there is a, a negativity there, not just between self and other, but also within the self. As, as well. Um, and so it was a really interesting kind of uh, 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 experience, I think, of kind of alienation or maybe even self-emptying, um, but I think a really helpful one for my students and also for me myself. I, it makes me think of, of a couple of things that might draw us into the realm of speaking a little bit more about the ambivalence term. So, um, you know, Ling Chi Wong, a longtime professor of Asian American studies that uh, UC Berkeley wrote a piece in 1995 on dual domination. And the kind of questions that arise in studies of, of Chinese diaspora, where um, members of Chinese diaspora, on the one hand, have to deal, say, in the United States, to take an example, with how Chinese are perceived from hegemonic positions within the United States under categories of assimilability or um, permanent residence or things along those lines. And uh, the paradigm, say, from mainland China or Republic of China, um, depending upon historical period and political orientation, uh, revolve around questions, say, of loyalty or cultural continuity, like how Chinese are you and how far have you moved uh, from uh, positions that are recognizable. I, I know that we've talked about this in numerous Facebook chat or other conversations as well, but um, one of the things that is helpful to think about too in terms of just basic histories of nationalist formation in both Japan and China, which are um, nations which are most pertinent to maybe our interests, have to do with um, the role of diasporas in national formation. Mm -hmm. You know, I my ancestry in part traces to Zhongshan in, in Guangdong province, and that city is named after uh, Sun Zhongshan. Uh, whose name comes from uh, an alias that was given to him in Japan when he was on the on the run and in exile. Nakayama uh, is read in those terms, and without his sojourn, say in Hawaii, Indonesia, um, the United States, you know, the articulation of Chinese nationalism, at least within uh, that uh, early republican context or early nationalist 
uh, context in the early 20th century would be in many ways un unimaginable. Mm -hmm. uh, but thinking about how transit dislocation uh, are parts of recognition of the need for and formation of uh, modern Chinese national identity uh, are yeah. maybe one way of thinking through that. Yeah, yeah I, I would bring up, and I have brought it before, um, you know, the uh, late Qing translation of um, Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin by Lin Shu, uh, which was perhaps the most popular translation of foreign literature at the time uh, by Lin Shu in classical Chinese. And um, he has this preface, and I, I've taught this in graduate seminars where he's making this, this, um, this analogy um, between uh, the story of enslaved peoples in Americas and then the treatment meted out to Chinese laborers in the West Coast, right? And that he talks about the, uh, the, uh, the, the poison of racism, uh, the poisonous, uh, um, uh, that, uh, that's like the venom of a poisonous snake uh, that it, it, after it, um, you know, it bites it, its enemy, it still has residue venom. And so it has to release it somewhere. So it releases it onto a random leaf or a random weed. And that's kind of how, that's a metaphorical figure that talks about of how Chinese laborers then suffer this analogous forms of oppression after this had been meted out to the enslaved um, Black Americans, right? Um, and I find it such an interesting statement because it becomes a kind of attempt at self-recognition. What does it mean for us to be Chinese in a time of semi-colonialism, in a time of a, of a faltering Qing empire? How are we seeking forms of recognition through this fantastic mirror of Uncle Tom's Cabin? Does this work? Does this not work? What are the limits of that? You know? And so one of the most interesting things is not whether or not this is accurate or not accurate. It is likely inaccurate in the, in the details by, by all means, right? You know, Chinese coolie labor was not the same as child slavery. But what's interesting is the uh, speculative attempt to think through what it might mean to be a Chinese nation in relation to what's happening in America in the 1850s, 1860s. Um, I think this might be a good way to activate the, the kind of running term that you introduced at the beginning, which was the idea of travel and the way that you know, we as literary scholars tend to think of a text traveling or in transit mm -hmm. through the dynamics of translation. You know, what is being transformed, what is being broken, lost, and um, what are the imaginative acts of translation, I guess, uh, to uh, work through here. And there's something interesting going on uh, about that analogy and the structure that you've pointed out there, which is not the same thing to go back to that identity term as an identification, right? That extremely multi-layered compound um, metaphor of the discharge of venom into another object mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. one of black people or slaves are coolies, right? It's mm -hmm. not a, an equation of identity, mm -hmm. um, but a, a transposition mm -hmm. or a replacement operation um, that that's really interesting to, to, to think through. And might be, you know, I, I know that within our, our, our fields, there are many folks that speak about um, discourses of, of translation as, as being particularly uh, important to think through um, folks well, I, that, I, yeah. So I think, I mean, it's a really great place to kind of think, we're both literary scholars, we both work on translations, we both translated. The place of literature and translation as a place that takes us beyond a certain kind of antinomial dichotomous thinking and so when we think about identity and non-identity, we often think of it in, in binary terms of inclusion and exclusion. And very often we're unable to think, you know, to kind of step away and kind of take a notice of the whole, right? Um, and, what I, what I, and, and what I find the power of the aesthetics of art, of literature and of translation that is attempting to do that. Right, it's attempting to both lay out the positions of antinomy, but also to lay out how they are uh, presented together in a darstellung, so to speak, right, in a grander presentation through narrative, through translation, through art. That there's something about art that admits the antinomy, admits the kind of traveling back and forth between Asia and Asian America, but also wants us to think about the ways that they cohere together, even if paradoxically. I wonder if you had some comments on, uh, on that. Yeah, so um, 
the the thought that comes to mind is uh, I last night was was reading Naoki Sakai mm -hmm. on um, one way that this comes to uh, together and might help in terms of it, your caution earlier um, about uh, not thinking of homecoming as a dialectical resolution is that uh, Sakai's take on this is that uh, translation is a, a way of um, pointing out that one ver one version of dialectical thinking in, in terms of antinomies is um, a very old Porphyrian scholastic uh, distinction of a genus into species based upon antinomial difference. Like what are the splits or distinctions within a genus that uh, create differentiation or speciation? And uh, translation is not just about like matching one-to-one -one across like a bifurcated genus as a species split, but pointing out that there are fundamentally different orders of organization taxonomy mm -hmm. or things uh, that need to be uh, worked out or imaginably leapt through um, in, in the process of, of thinking about um, translation as something other than identification or contrast or comparison. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, think, you know, uh, conventionally speaking, we think of translation as, as somehow secondary to the original, you know, um, that it's not the source, it's the target, it is somehow secondary. Um, but I'm inspired because translation is such an important thing when you think about, you know, modern Chinese literature, Asian American literature, the work that the translation that you do, the translation that I've done, um, to think of translation in a much more kind of fuller way and, and with, with full plenitude. And, and I want to thank, she's among our attendees, uh, Myra Potara for getting me to think about this. We were reading um, <clears throat> about kenosis, um, um, Alex Dubelay's book, um, The Self-Emptying Subject, uh, to think of translation, not as a kind of secondary or secondhand kind of relay, but as an act of self-emptying, right? An act of, 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 of self-emptying towards a possible universality all the while acknowledging, admitting the imperfection, the infelicity, the gap that happens in translation as well. And I, and I find that to be a really um, powerful way of rethinking translation that doesn't escape or doesn't you know, dispense completely with universality. Oh, we're just, you know, it's just pure play of translation, but becomes in many ways a certain kind of um, act of faith uh, 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 that can become really uh, important. Um, we're running out of time, uh, so, so forgive me if I, I just switch. Um, uh, I want to ask you about the move towards the global. So global Asia's, uh, uh, global studies. Uh, you know, we are entering a brave new world of a new academic formation of global studies that will amalgamate all the languages uh, and, and international relations and so on. And I know that you've been thinking about the globe uh, and, 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 and modalities of the world. And so I was wondering if you had some thoughts uh, about that. Yeah, that's a very different direction than where I thought you were going, which was to focus on the homecoming term. So I think that that might be... Um, well, 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 let me just interrupt you, but yeah. in many ways, the world is often seen as a kind of homecoming, right? Mm. Right. Yeah. Like um, films, a universal language. Right. You know, like my world is the my, my home is the world and these kind of flipping cosmopolitan statements. Yeah. And the, the kind of um, idea of global mastery is that you circumnavigate the globe and come back. And that is how you, you as a colonizing explorer or mapper or others establish cartographic uh, mastery by, by coming home or establishing one's um, Greenwich Meridian as the center, say, of, of timekeeping of, of the globe or something along those lines. So um, those might be directions to think about. Um, I'm also maybe here thinking, and you're mentioning a, a lot of forms of consolidation, mm -hmm. uh, departmental consolidation of national literature departments or area studies under an overarching umbrella of global studies. Um, and there's, of course, a lot to be cautious about here as with more generally discourses of globalism and globalization as modes of uh, rationalizing and, and you know, finding financial efficiency in the organization of unruly uh, departments. There, there is a, I think, significant fear uh, and 
well-grounded series of, of objections about thinking about what um, globalization in, in those uh, modes does to flatten and actually not create a rounded picture of uh, the um, worlds that we live in. I might maybe take this in, in another direction, which is to think um, a little bit about, I, I, I presented on this at the Association for Asian Studies a, a little while back on a presidential panel with, uh, hosted by Christine Yano on undisciplining uh, global Asias. And one of the things here to be wary about is that the globe is nothing new. Uh, it's been operative at least from constructions of celestial spheres of identifying you know, a relationship between the fixed stars and, and the earth in terms of spherical global uh, configurations to you know, think about that in both Indian Chinese astronomies as well as uh, ones understood as Western. Uh, and one image that really uh, comes to mind for me is that uh, the Shin Sekai newspaper um, had an image of a globe, and I'll, I'll see if I can dig this image up and maybe share it in the screen in Q&A later, uh, which was an utterly distorted version of the globe, which has Japan on one side occupying vastly disproportionate amounts of space in the Western United States and another with the rising sun of Japan on one side and the stars and stripes on the other to imagine this kind of global order configured by a Japanese American newspaper with the Shin Sekai newspaper as unifying all forms of the globe. And this is in a, you know, a community uh, media orientation, but I, I can't help but wonder if that early 20th century version of a, glo a global imagination as distortion might also carry forward into some of the configurations that we might be more familiar with in 20, 21st century academia. Well, I, you know, I, I think that's so important to, to remind us that there's nothing new about the globe. There's nothing new about Akio's universality. And in terms of inverted images, um, and I'm going to look for that one too, uh, uh, I'm reminded of um, Dongfang Zhazhi, Eastern Michelini, kind of like the, you know, the National Geographic of China. Uh, 1933, the New Year's, uh, New Year's edition of 1933, I believe, um, the cover was done by the great uh, cartoonist Feng Zikai. And it shows, uh, it's a comic kind of image of a overgrown baby who is scrubbing a globe in a wash basin. And the portion of the globe the baby is scrubbing is, is China. Uh, and then on the corner of the, uh, the image, um, there is a bottle of Lysol. Uh, and so the baby is literally scrubbing, disinfecting China with Lysol. Uh, in this globe uh, that is smaller than the baby uh, in this, this thing. And, and it's, it's, an, it, it, it's, it's meant to be a dream image. So it's, it's, there's a certain kind of oneric inversion that is happening there. Uh, and it's an interesting kind of um, image because it's kind of like, what, what do we mean when we say the world? What do we mean when we say the globe? So we see things like hygienic modernity. We see capitalist exchange uh, through the Lysol bottle. Uh, we see the kinds of inversion where the globe uh, becomes the object uh, and where the baby is the subject cleaning uh, that globe. Um, and I think this kind of appeal, you know, when we think of the globe, not to think of it as a normative universal that is given, but to think of the globe as something that is always already subject to inversion. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Uh, it makes sense to me. I mean, in, if we think about it in terms of uh, not only inversion, but uh, questions of projection reflection as well. Um, that the globe, at least when compressed onto a map or something like that, you know, always involves some form of distortion. Um, I wanted to ask Kylie if it's possible to enable uh, screen sharing and also, you know, recognize that we're approaching the moment in time that we should switch over to more Q&A. Okay, uh, I'm I want to do the same thing too. So if you could do that for me as well, that'd be great, Kelly. Sorry. Uh, so here's the image that I, I was talking about here. I, I did my best to describe it verbally, but um, as you can see, uh, Japan is not this large uh, in relationship to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and so this global imaginary or world imaginary involves a, a, a tremendous uh, distortion of, of what you know an accurate representation of this would look like, but in some ways it's not about the accuracy; it's about uh, the projective imagination. 
And, and let me see if I can share mine. Um, Kylie, can you enable uh, screen share? Do I need to make you. Yeah, I. <laughs> you need to you need to surrender uh, your your sovereignty unto me. Oh, I love Zoom. Okay. Uh, so here's my image. Um, so this is the cover of Donghuang Dodger, and you can definitely see. Uh, let's show here. Oh shit, that's not what I wanted. Um, but uh, you could see there, you know, the baby uh, cleaning the globe in the wash basin, uh, the soap, the Lysol, and so here you kind of have, you know, the, the oneric, the dreamlike inversion of signifiers that are happening. Uh, and this is this is the cover of the New Year's edition. Um, um, but yeah, we are at 537. So we want to invite uh, people to chime in with comments, questions, denunciations. Uh, we welcome any one. I'm not seeing anything yet. Uh, don't see anything yet, but I have, um, oh, I have something that, that I might want you to respond to. And, you know, I'm sorry this is uh, anchored in my own biography, but it is something I've observed um, just as someone within the Asian diaspora, um, you know, uh, and uh, it's, not, it's not what I study. Um, I work on genetics and caste. Uh, which has a diasporic element, but it's slightly different there. But the one of the things that I, I found really striking was, and this is this is probably inflects a lot of the South Asian media, uh, some of the concerns in the late '90s and early aughts was this idea of the non-resident Indian and um, the dualism, and I think. At the beginning, Andrew spoke about the the cliche of living in two worlds, that kind of thing, and it 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 really is. And I'm interested in just your thoughts or your responses by this. You know, the um, I'm not actually Indian. Um, I'm of South Asian origin, but um, my parents are from Africa, and so if anything, I see myself as uh, uh, African, uh, a Canadian, and you know by in legal terms I'm an American as well um, in terms of passports mm, I am of South Asian origin though and but but more than just the categories is is the the habit so one of the things that I observe you know particularly among the women in my family of all generations is this this mode of always living in translation um, and, and, and you can understand that I mean the the wave of um, Indians that came to East Africa um, that I, that, you know, my family's from were brought by the British to stimulate business in the early 20th century and become like a petty middle class in between Africans and uh, the, the British, the whites. And um, what's interesting is that there are many kinds of acts of translation that they're in almost every interaction doing kind of seamlessly, um, you know, without, without thinking about dualism, right? This is this, this cliche of, of being in two worlds, Andrew mentioned, and the, yeah, they're just um, between themselves and Africans. And then if you recall, the, we were in Africa for several generations. So, um, you know, they weren't, it wasn't like there was some reference to India. Like, for example, my parents went to India as tourists um, and they had no, no concept for them. Home was Tanzania and Uganda. And, and that, that's continued through the generations. And the, so I grew up in Canada, but the, the idea of home was Tanzania and Uganda, though I, I still haven't actually been there. I've been to the other corners of Africa, but not East Africa. So is there, um, what are your thoughts about this? this kind of continual simultaneous translation without those reference of like, um, I mean, Roy, you referred to self and other. Um, I, I feel this community is, has been in migration for so many generations. Those, those dualisms, we don't, we don't have them. Um, yeah. 
can I just jump in if that's okay before? Um, you know, I, I sometimes tell my students a story about like when I was growing up, my parents were, were, were immigrants and, and they, weren't, um, they, didn't, they weren't particularly educated. They were very working class. Um, and this is a very common experience uh, when you are um, native, native born, right? And so uh, that from a very young age, you become the translator for your parents. Uh, you're on the phone with insurance adjusters. You're on the phone with with doctors. You're on the phone with with all. And and when you're seven or eight years old, you have no freaking idea how insurance works. Uh, but you're trying to somehow broker uh, a, a transaction on a subject you know nothing about between two languages, one of which you're pretty good in, another my Cantonese you're not very good in, right? Um, and it's funny because that was my childhood for a very long time. It was not something that I found unusual. It was not something that I found worthy of celebration or something that could be an academic subject. It was just simply the texture of my everyday life. Uh, and so it's really interesting then, you know, when I teach and I have students who come from, you know, uh, they call themselves third culture kids. Oh, I'm a third culture kid. I'm like, what is that? What is the third culture? What is the third term here? Um, and, and do you actually think of it as a third culture in, in quotation marks? It, it's an interesting thing, like what happens with something that's really quite banal and really doesn't kind of approach um, uh, kind of uh, approach knowledge, right? It's not something I know. It's just something I do, right? Becomes a kind of interesting category for for, pe uh, for people. Um, Andrew, why don't you jump in? I'm getting some questions in the Q and A, so I want to make sure I get to those. But why don't you, Andrew? Why don't you go ahead and chime in if you have something to say to our yeah, thoughts? I, I think that this might also help to speak to what I, I sometimes think of as, as like a nationalist obsession with, with identity um, as in the category of non-resident Indian. And the, the category that blew me away when I, I was living in Japan was um, Zainichi Nikkeijin or person of Japanese descent who is resident in Japan, but by implication, not a Japanese citizen. And this struck me as like a very weird uh, category where uh, like there's, I think reasons to be very suspicious of uh, and wary of of modes of nationalist identification or national ident uh, identity that assume a, a complete homogeny of language, location, and um, uh, identity uh, of, of, of self-image or something like that. Um, I, I think that this also ties to Roy's example of the uh, questions of, of what gets valorized as forms of linguistic mastery of say like a national literary canon um, versus the kind of linguistic diversity that one encounters in many places in the world where you have a village language and a dialect, you have a market language and a dialect, you have a school language and a dialect, you have a national language and dialect. So you could be quadra or quintilingual and this would just be the, the way things are and not um, you know, tied to uh, questions of, of identity, like, you know, whether or not you, your market language is your home language or your national language uh, it correlates with, with that or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah. so, so we have two questions uh, and I just, I'm, I'm gonna just read them both so that, um, so, uh, so that we kind of have them in discussion. So Andrew, take notes and buck up. So first is from our uh, colleague Tara Fickle in the Department of English. Uh, and she says, I had a question based on the way you two began about sitting with the productive tension and diversions between how you see yourself and want to be seen. This reminds me of the way solidarity politics, especially interracial solidarity, has often been theorized as fundamentally premised on difference rather than sameness, for example, as opposed to a relationship of identity. Might this productive ambivalence you discuss, which haunts so much Asian American experience, give you additional insight into, quote, external, unquote, solidarity among divergent groups and perspectives, or even vice versa? And the next question is from Professor uh, Bryna Goodman of the Department of History and also in Asian Studies. And she asks, I wonder if you might address the academic and institutional boundary politics between Asian American studies and Asian studies, both past and present. How do ongoing boundary issues affect your work, both publication and teaching? There's also the issue of the politics of speaking slash not speaking in Asian language. So there you go. One question about solidarity uh, uh, and another question about academic disciplinary formation and boundary. Um, take it away, Andrew. Yeah, maybe I'll handle the 
Tara's question first and then segue into uh, Brenna's uh, question as well. Um, and the way that I, I have tended to think about this more recently is, is through a, a return to the work of Gloria Anzodua in Borderlands La Frontera and uh, a recognition there of um, actually another text, not, not that one, but an address that you know, she presented in 1983 uh, on the thematics of um, bridge, island, uh, drawbridge and, and, and sandbar as different models for thinking about alliance politics within the context that Anzadua was addressing, um, uh, different feminist solidarities and possibilities or alliance politics uh, during that moment in which uh, a key question at that moment was say uh, lesbian separatism versus um, what Anzadua identified as a uh, kind of critique of women of color who also were engaged with not a separatist mode, but um, uh, engaging in their communities of, of color as well. And trying to think about how to uh, negotiate um, what alliance politics means there. And, and, and in some ways it's not about like a, a mode of solidarity, which uh, with all of the kind of con uh, connotations of needing to maintain clearly defined uh, lines of, of identity matched up to uh, one's politics, but to think, okay, sometimes you can be a bridge, but that means that uh, your labor is being exploited. You're turned into that bridge and no, no one can sustain that for lots of time. So maybe knowing when to draw that bridge up and, and put it down is an important thing to do there. Or you might want to think in, in separatist terms, if it is possible for you to completely isolate uh, and not uh, draw or interact with other communities um, or uh, and focus on, on developing one's own. And then uh, the metaphor that Ansudua ends up on is this kind of sandbar approach of sometimes you're there, sometimes you're underwater, sometimes uh, you can connect and that moves with uh, the, the rhythms that you happen to be in any given time. And I think a return to this kind of thinking about occasional coalition aggregate uh, and not like day in, day out, every moment of one's waking life needs to be committed to solidarity or the cause uh, might be one way to move forward. Uh, I wonder the, if I could yeah. jump in before you answer uh, Professor Goodman's question, but I don't, I, you know, I'm working on a chapter about um, solidarity between Chinese and Russians during this Russian civil war and the Russian text and there's like many different Chinese translations. And one of the things that's, you know, I'm really thinking about solidarity and the issue of the fact that it has to be found on a kind of belief, on a kind of faith that can't be guaranteed. So there's always gonna be that risk. Like it's, it's, I think one of the problems we have in thinking about solidarity is that it has to be completely guaranteed or articulated or vouchsafed, the terms of the solidarity, of, 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 of engagement, the terms of the, of the solidarity. When, and and we, if we want to exercise that element of the unknowable, the unguaranteeable, right? Um, and I think I think kind of trying to uh, think more speculatively about the issue of solidarity as one that that kind of acknowledges its fragility, the fragility of the commitments necessary to forge solidarity in some ways a more healthier way than kind of like why don't these two groups get along, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's just something I want to add. But I want you to also uh, go on. Yeah, I think that that why don't these two groups get along question is very pertinent to the, the question of what's going on with uh, academic and institutional uh, boundary politics between Asian American studies and Asian studies. And, you know, we, we certainly don't have enough time to do uh, a historical recovery of, of uh, intentions and origins of uh, these uh, two fields. Um, I would maybe say here uh, that one thing to maybe work out uh, is along a kind of alliance politics kind of, of question. Um, I would say under the conditions of thinking about uh, global consolidations, financialization of the university, privatization and things along those lines uh, to invoke the sandbar metaphor, the ocean of, of academia is, is kind of the reverse of the global warming sea rise problem. It's like things are being dried out. <laughs> there's, there's not much space. And it, I, I'm, I'm personally not that invested in relitigating or refighting um, 
fights that were def defined under different historical conditions uh, between say Asian studies and Asian American studies in the 80s or 60s. I'm and, and interested in, in academic and, and other reasons for tracing what those uh, fights look like. But I think under present circumstances, um, fighting for uh, resources and coalition with between both is probably more likely to be uh, uh, where where we are. I mean, the the issues are more about defunding of uh, humanities social sciences across the the board and uh, a shift towards uh, STEM economics, uh, data sciences, et cetera, that that need to be uh, addressed from from that perspective. You know, one of the things I always tell my students when I talk about things like democracy and what it means to live in a society and community is that, you know, we don't have to like each other, but we have to learn how to live together. And for me, this kind of like, we might not like each other, but we have to live together, that there's a certain kind of, in that second proposition, that there's a certain kind of uh, ethical categorical imperative that I think is actually much more interesting than, oh, how do we get along, right? <laughs> it's like, how, how, how do you cohere in the face of the fact that we actually don't get along, right? Uh, and, and not try to force a certain kind of kumbaya moment of convergence of will and desire and, and recognition, right? Um, which I think is a much harder thing because I think, especially in a very personalized politics, you know, we all want to be liked. We all want to be accepted for each other. Well, is there a possible way where we don't have to do that, but we can still cohere in something meaningful? Um, it's kind of, you know, one thing that I, I'm thinking about it uh, in terms of that. Um, yeah, also well, maybe uh, the difference between uh, coalition and conversation versus mastery and possession is one to think about too. So the, the dichotomy between say speaking and not speaking an Asian language uh, is maybe not a, a binaristic formulation. And it's also, you know, what languages are prestige languages, right? Like you, you can't really in the United States with a very few exceptions, take classes in Cantonese. Yeah, I was gonna bring that up. It's not like a prestige mm -hmm. a literature, even though in, in or, or a prestige vernacular, um, even though in some ways it would be easier to learn Cantonese in order to you know, study pre-modern Chinese poetry in order to get a sense of preservation of, of rhyme and things like that. Um, and so I, I know we need to wrap things up, but one way of thinking about this is that uh, I, I advise students all the time in the in, in English department who are worried about what the terms of engagement, mastery, proficiency are, what those standards mean, and what kinds of, of work are possible. And there are, you know, there's a difference, say, between uh, what I would hope many Asianists pursue, which is being conversant in Asian American studies without claiming to master mm -hmm. Asian American studies. And I would hope the reverse is also true, that uh, just because somebody within Asian American studies or ethnic literatures in, of the United States or the Americas is interested in Asian languages, it doesn't mean that they want to like colonize and take over, mm -hmm. or it should, uh, questions of national literary traditions in China, Japan, Korea. It might just mean being able to stage conversations between mm -hmm. those disciplines. And in many ways, I think, you know, this is something that we are trying to model in our own conversation where we, you know, despite our decades long friendship, we embrace the abyss between us <laughs> and use and, and see that as, as something that actually helps our, uh, our, our uh, collective pursuit of both knowledge and eventually perhaps justice. Um, so I think maybe that's, we'll, we'll end with that. Uh, Arafat, do, do you have any last words or? take us away. I'll take you away, no last words. Um, so thank you both of you for a very engaging discussion. Um, yeah, I think we could continue this discussion. I hope we can. Um, in other venues, uh, there's a lot of U of O folks, people from the West Coast. So hopefully, <clears throat> I don't know when this will happen. Things, it'll be safer to travel and we our, our paths will cross physically and we can continue these discussions. But thank you again to both of our speakers, <clears throat> Ray Chan, who's um, in um, uh, EALL at University of Oregon and Andrew Wei Leong, who's at, in the Department of English at UC Berkeley. Before I let everyone go, I just wanted to plug again our, our, our final talk um, of the series, uh, Bioethics in the Time of 
Black Lives Matter, a Black Feminist pr Perspective. That will be on Thursday, May 27th, uh, starting at 4.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everyone who joined us. I hope everyone stays healthy, safe, and sane. Thank you.